Okay, we are going back to the student waiting equity bill. And Secretary French, uh, welcome. And we thought we'd give you a chance to comment. Um, we've been taking testimony on um, the, I gotta check my notes, property, uh, education finance advisory committee and Ed, yeah, Education Fund Advisory Committee, um, which kind of takes some things that you do now and just this is your chance to tell us what you think about the whole thing. Well, I appreciate that. Good afternoon, Dan French, uh, Secretary of Education. Um, also have Brad James uh, from the agency listening in. Um, it's good to see you all. Yeah, thank you. I provided uh, a written summary of my uh, testimony um, and I'm reacting to the drafting request uh, that I saw. Um, what I, and there's so many different elements and I think that's the first <clears throat> first observation I'd make. It's, it's nice to see all this coming together into a single bill because uh, there's so many different interrelated uh, policy pieces relative to education and specifically, you know, we have the waiting study which was commissioned um, largely as a result of Act 173. And the question, um, if we were to move from a um, reimbursement model and special ed funding to a block grant, to what extent uh, should there be some consideration in the calculation of that block grant for districts that have higher numbers of students with disabilities than others? And part of the answer in the waiting study was, well, actually, maybe not. If uh, the pupil weights were working properly, and if, and I mean by properly, if uh, particularly the poverty weight was functioning um, in a basis that was attributed to cost in a, in a rational way, then uh, perhaps we wouldn't need to make adjustments to the block grant. So again, I think these pieces are coming together now at this point in the legislative session, which is really good to see. Um, and there's also a piece here relative to our uh, the policy interest in universal meals, so the issue of the poverty weight um, and how that's determined now versus how we'd like to see it calculated in the future. All these things are coming together, and they do uh, you know do require some um, thinking on our part to react to. So I apologize if my, apologize if my testimony isn't sort of the normal uh, exemplary narrative that I often produce, but it's it's kind of point by point and. Um, I'll speak to it uh, in an outline basis and it'll be open to questions, certainly, if you have any. Outlines are really good. <laughs> okay. The chair uh, likes bullets. Yeah. I really wanted to say I've been busy with other stuff, but I'll, I'll <laughs> take it. this. But um, no, I think it's great to see these pieces coming together. And it is, it is challenging on the one hand in a positive way to respond because they're, these things are interrelated. And I think we see that clearly at the agency, the interrelationship between 173 waiting study and, and the issues of universal meals, they have common denominators. So firstly, I'll start right off on page six, uh, this idea of universal income, de income declaration form and moving for a, towards a different way uh, to leverage a poverty indicator. I think this is long overdue. I think people have been struggling on this uh, at the national level for a while. We know the idea of free and reduced lunch has been a proxy for poverty, but not necessarily a, a, a tightly accurate one. So this is a this is a really important undertaking. I uh, just want to call out, um, you know, I appreciate in the preamble to the, the drafting request of the bill, uh, there's some acknowledgement the agency would need additional staff. This is an area, and I'll speak to it at the end of my outline, uh, where we will need additional staff because basically what goes on now in terms of the determining of free and reduced lunch eligibility takes place in each school district around the state. We audit that at the state level, but we're not directly involved in that certification. This, this process is an entirely new one. It uh, will require us to not only stand up um, a form to do that, but there's different ways we could do this depending on how much assurance you'd want us to provide. But this was an area where you did not specify position support. And it's one I would argue we do need position support depending on how we set it up. But uh, just I'll speak to that again towards the end. But but, was that going to the universal declaration? Yes. Okay. And that, can you kind of fill us in a little bit on what that would look like? Is this something that every family would fill out? Is this something... Yes, I, I think so. I mean, again, there's a couple different ways we could do this and the, the devil's in the details relative to uh, the demand on the agency. But, um, you know, 
to speak of how we do this now, again, we have this, what, what we'll call a proxy for poverty and the eligibility of free and reduced lunch. So at the beginning of every school year, we ask parents to sign up for this to determine if they're eligible. And there's a couple of ways one can become eligible. If you're already eligible for other state programs, you're automatically what's called direct certified for eligibility. Uh, and then there's some, there is some income uh, screening eligibility. Uh, there's a way you can, you can, when I used to do this as a principal, there's there, the USDA gives us like criteria to use. We'd ask parents to provide an estimate of their pay. And if it fell in, you'd look it up on a table and you'd determine whether they were eligible for free or reduced lunch. Um, then we've had policies like community eligibility, where entire school populations have become eligible for, for free and reduced lunch. So it, the point is, over time, this has become less and less an accurate description of actual levels of poverty. And it's sort of baked into so many different indicators, it's hard to pull it apart. I mean, like we use free and reduced lunch levels for E-rate reimbursement levels and stuff like that. So it's, it's a hard one to unpack. At any rate, this would move to a, basically an income uh, basis. And uh, my understanding is families would uh, declare this form on an annual basis. And this would largely be processed at the state level as opposed to the local level. And that's the big shift. Um, so there's a couple different ways we could do that. I think we've, you know, we've worked on that with the task force over the summer. Uh, there's, there's a lot of support, again, coming from the universal meals approach. Uh, but there's acknowledgement that this is, there are some data issues here that need to unpack in the, I think it's a good idea, but the agency would uh, have to, it would be a fundamental new shift in how we do this and would require uh, us to stand up some new processes. There's some, there's some ways we could do that that would be lighter on the need for new positions than others, but um, you know, it's still gonna be a new process. Uh, next point I'd make on uh, page seven, <clears throat> and this, these two next two items are kind of together, which is the actual weights that are uh, being articulated in the, the draft bill and also the trans, you know, like then the transition aspects. Um, I think it's great to see this coming together. Um, you know, Brad James has been deployed with the task force to provide that technical assistance relative to modeling and to working with JFO to do that and so forth. Um, now that we're getting closer to understanding what the weights would be, I think it's, it's a good moment to pause for a second and, and specifically take a look at uh, the intersection between the weights and the proposed special ed block grant. So we need to understand on a district by district basis, how would be people be affected? Um, because that leads us into the transition, you know, like what's gonna be required to sort of soften that, that integration, but the two are directly related. So I think it's important that we look at not only the weights, but also the implementation of the special ed block grant, which coincidentally is also coming online from a policy perspective. So we do have an opportunity to do that analysis. And I think it's one, at this point, I'm not prepared to say, oh, these, these weights are good or bad. I think we need to admire the whole package, if you will, and on a district by district basis and ensure um, that's gonna work, but also ensure the transition would work. And that uh, gets me to my next point on the transition aspects, which are on page 21. Uh, specifically, there's a proposal to suspend both the uh, excess penalty threshold for several years, as well as the whole harmless provision on equalized pupils. Uh, I, I don't know yet if that's needed, to what extent both are needed or just one. But again, I think if we did the modeling on the, um, on the implications of the weights on a district by district basis in conjunction with a special ed block grant, that we'd then be able to consider um, any kind of suspension of the cost containment mechanisms um, to allow that transition to happen in a thoughtful way. Okay. I guess we've got to have this bill out if it's going anywhere in the next <laughs> okay. two weeks. Um, so I'm trying to find a way that we can move it forward because uh, this committee has not touched special ed block grants. Um, yeah, I just, so I would say by design, they're, they're directly, time. they're directly related. I mean, that was the impetus behind the waiting yeah, okay. study. Yeah. You know, so I, it's, and we I have, think that was during my transition time from then yeah. back here. Yeah. And I think, you know, honestly, I think most districts have accepted that the, it's likely the block grant will go forward. Um, but part of that is we were committed to ensuring that, that people are not experiencing an abrupt adjustment and, mm -hmm understanding how they would also then be affected by the weighting change is going to be an important consideration, you know? So if okay. a district was suddenly going to see an abrupt decline in special ed funding through the block grant, but then could be reassured they're going to pick up more equalized pupils through the revisions of the weighting system, that would go a long way to smoothing their transition. 
Yes, it would. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, and you know, Brad and I had a chance to connect. Brad, um, you know, Brad's been deployed on this topic on a, almost a daily, if not hourly, basis for several weeks. Um, you know, in terms of the rapidity by which we could do that modeling, I, I defer to him on that. But we're we've been actively involved, so we can start to pull these things together fairly quickly. I think. Um, I make I made some comments about the evaluation and reporting mechanisms, which I it just struck me as very significant. Honestly, um, I was I was yeah you know, I, I believe the auditor is largely charged for doing this, but um, that's also going to have significant impact on school districts, no doubt, who are going to be requested yeah. to provide data. So I just I, I it wasn't hard for me to write several sentences there about this. I'm I'm concerned that it is a significant undertaking. It would be significant even if we were not uh, coming out of the pandemic or even if we weren't also contemplating significant changes to the funding system. Um, but I think as you're aware, uh, there's a lot of instability in, in uh, school districts right now and particularly in the, the financial aspects. We don't we don't have a really solid understanding of how what the patterns are because districts are able to leverage their federal dollars to a certain extent. We know there's staffing shortages. We know there's upward pressure on uh, some of the, the staffing arrangements as appropriately there should be. So there's a lot of a lot of variables at play right now. So it's going to be really hard to do this. Okay. But I think importantly, um, we're also coincidentally or unfortunately seeing a huge demand now for additional reporting requirements, you know, because there's been a lot of federal dollars pushed out. Yeah. Um, I was on a national call last night with some of my colleagues from around the country, and this was the topic that came up almost immediately that a lot of concern uh, about the reporting requirements, but then more specifically, the ability of school districts to actually do the reporting because there's staffing shortages. And we're also pointing districts to really, really try to get into the recovery work in education. So there's a lot of new work that has to happen. And it's not clear to me how we're going to be able to accomplish, you know, sort of thread the needle both on the reporting requirements and um, in actually doing the okay. work. And we, we saw that just another example, you know, we we're trying to stand up some data reporting on vaccination rates in schools, which is, it's actually fairly simple reporting, but we, we couldn't get people the time to do the reporting because they were particularly school nurses were so involved in doing contact tracing and everything else. We just, we couldn't get, we only had a 50% response to that. So we had to come up with another way to come up with the information. So I'm, I'm afraid that type of reaction is going to be happening if um, people okay. don't have the capacity. I think the auditor is on the same page with you. He said his yeah. experience that some data, which you think should be readily available, it yeah. is very difficult to get and you have to get it. And that was before the schools. And I think That's we right. do all understand that schools are under real stress. Personally, I'd like them to be focusing on helping yeah. the kids get caught up on the two years they've missed um in regular yeah. school attendance and um yeah we have you know, data quality issues in our education yeah. system due to its decentralization and we just yep. accept that but it's uh, the auditors were very familiar with that as we've worked with them closely <laughs> yep. on other projects <laughs> this uh this one's going to be really challenging, I think, in this environment. Okay. And it's very and, comprehensive, yeah. too. I mean, it really asks, like, everything, you know. So. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and we may need to find a middle ground. But I think, you know, he said he'd be happy to do the uh, audit, but um, he needs some criteria and a baseline. Yeah. And uh, to measure against. And that really falls into your valid yeah. wick. Uh, how do we measure it? I know there's some concerns about standardized tests just with any student right now, given the yeah. disruption. And, but how do we know all these changes have made any difference in the lives of students? Right. Um, and that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, no, it is. It's going to be a challenge to create a good evaluation model in this context. I think, yep. The solution is probably a simplification and looking for um, some, I'll say, dipstick indicators. Like if we could think about a few indicators as opposed to 20 and uh, they'll be imperfect, but we can generalize from them on some larger trends. And I think it's also important to uh, understand the regional variation in Vermont. I think that's always been a, a key mm -hmm. takeaway for me in my career that, you know, what happens in the kingdom isn't necessarily the same thing that's happening in Chittenden County. We need to understand that. Right. Um, okay. So, um, uh, Senator, I, Brock, Senator Brock has a question. Sure. 
just a comment in terms of looking at how you measure things. One of the key things, it seems to me, is to devise your part of your measurement system to try to identify what change or what factor is is impacting a particular result. Uh, otherwise, you know, you blend things together, and you have something that's absolutely adverse to what you're trying to do. <laughs> where something else is positive to it, the two cancel each other out. And unless, and that's why there's a real trick and, and challenge, I, I would assume the education establishment has, is working with the auditor to, to identify what things to measure and then how to determine whether or not those things actually made the difference. Yeah, I mean, there is, is you're speaking to a sort of causality, right? And um, it's oftentimes, like if you look at the weighting study itself, it's a mixture of qualitative uh, research and quantitative research. So we often in education have to go to the quantitative interviews to confirm some of the uh, variability we see in the qualitative analysis. And, you know, we did a, a project with the auditor on uh, purely financial. So, I mean, if there's a, a qualitative area that's fairly stable, you think the financial data would be pretty stable. And as you know, we've had difficulty implementing uniform chart of accounts, but the, the project we worked on directly recently had pertained to uh, uh, costs related to independent schools. You know, So we have that financial data and it, it does vary in, in quality, um, but then there's so many different types of independent schools. So immediately, you, know, you start to introduce all this variability. You know, uh, St. J Academy is not the same of a small therapeutic school with 12 kids. You know? uh, so you have all these different types of schools. Um, and then, you know, when we start thinking about outcomes, which is really where a lot of folks like to go in terms of logic models or measurement, you know, like, did the input actually cause the output? Um, you know, I've heard Dr. Mathis, who, you know, who's a well-regarded national researcher say something like, you know, 50% of that input is attributed to things outside of the school. So then you run into the issues like, well, what's going on in home life? What's happening in communities, you know, and it's hard to nail down, uh, the value added, if you will, of what happens inside the schoolhouse. But anyway, I digress. Fascinating topic. Um, okay. My next comments pertain to the Education Fund Advisory Committee, uh, which is mm -hmm. something I support. Uh, this is the first time we really start to see a description of what the duties are. Uh, my first bullet, I made an error, so I wanted to point that out. Uh, I was taking issue with the January 15th date. I thought that would be too late, but then uh, as I read further into it, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go back and correct myself that that was pertaining to a report to the General Assembly that the committee right. was charged to do. That's fine. Um, I thought the January 15th date was uh, what's my second bullet, which gets into the December 1st uh, letter the tax commissioner right. would typically do. Right. I Lloyd do not... Fiscal had the same interpretation. Oh, good. And so did I. So I think we've decided that we need to do a little wordsmith. Okay. You know, I think there's also a page break there. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's uh, what does it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out, I don't support the idea of trans, you know, we get into specific responsibilities, the advisory committee. I think it would still be prudent to have the executive branch and the tax commissioner be charged with making that proposal. Cause I see that December 1st layer uh, letter over the years being on the receiving end of that as a superintendent. Um, there's a formulaic requirement in the law about what goes into that letter. Certainly every governor and tax commissioners use that to make political statements over the years, but I think it's useful to keep it as a formulaic proposal. It's certainly, um, you know, the deliberative aspects of that the General Assembly always works on. So I didn't see a lot of value add coming into making that a deliberative process at the very end. I'd rather, my preference would it be keep it clinical and technical and, uh, and put it as a responsibility of the executive branch, maybe parallel to how the budget process unfolds. The governor proposes a budget and then the legislature says, thank you very much and works on that. Um, so I think there's value to keeping how it is. I'm not sure this would improve the context of the quality of that letter. Um, so I make that comment. And then lastly, about agency positions, um, you know, this is this again, I think, from my perspective, gets to the intersection of a number of these policies, which are, you know, we're looking at the whole body of work that's emerging relative to the pandemic and so forth. And uh, there, uh, I definitely think six positions are needed here. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with how they've been aligned in the preamble of the bill. Um, for example, I don't think um, the two positions I think were anticipated to be necessary for English language learners. Um, that's not how we had run that program at the state level. We uh, basically, the positions at the state level, currently we have one, is responsible for ensuring compliance with the federal program. 
Um, we, we buy into a larger national consortium of districts to provide the technical support and so forth. So that's been, I, I would say the pattern of most rural states in this area. I don't know if the, the additional positions were thought of as a, they wanted more boots on the ground from the agency to provide direct service, but that's not how we see the program being administered. So I think, you know, we could talk about the specifics here. I think the Ed Quality Standard one is also named and that's not really needed. Uh, I think we have strong consensus in the agency. We have a robust series of teams that do the continuous improvement work. But as I pointed out earlier, an area that is missing is the, the work related to the poverty indicator um, and certainly working with the weights. Um, you know, Brad James, who you all know and have affection for is really our sole person who manages those, the weights as we know them now. And that's a point of vulnerability for the agency. And it's one of the reasons I support the idea of creating um, the advisory committee, because I think there should be more eyes on the Ed Fund. But internal to the agency, it's important to acknowledge that um, this revision to weights uh, creates more complexity. We have new weights here, uh, such as the sparsity indicator. There's new reporting requirements with that. And there's going to therefore be additional technical support to school districts to implement it. Uh, not to say Brad hasn't done a phenomenally good job over the years, but um, you know we need we need to have more boots on the ground monitoring this and doing it right with districts. So I suspect all in all six positions are appropriate. I would just uh, I can come back at some future date if you'd like and provide more specificity on how I I think this initiative should be staffed. But I expect it won't be as heavy in ELL. It won't be uh, needed in edge quality, but will be needed in um, implementing the uh, poverty indication, uh, the weight, and also the related um, verification process necessary for the, the universal meals if that gets enacted. But then importantly, we just need bodies on the weight process itself and the financial management oversight of the function with school okay. districts. And that's so pretty Leah, much all I, I think This might be another place where we're going to have to put in a placeholder um for the other body to work on it um yeah and we have some you know depending on how these pieces come together because we've been thinking about certainly uh special education in our budget proposal we have additional federal funded positions in special education oversight as a result of 173 going live um we need to administratively assess all these pieces being enacted at the same time so that make sure they can be implemented and there's yeah. it's it also i think is uh it's a moment in time as we're contemplating coming out of the end of the pandemic. Is it a time where the agency is going to have a more direct role with operations or schools or a le are we snapping back to more of the local control? I think what we've learned is that the agency will be having a more uh, direct role in school operations going forward. Okay. Okay. Questions committee. not seeing any, but um, we do have your testimony in writing, at least outline, which is good. Um, and we'll be working through this. I think we'll try and get at least, you know, not the fine details, but just given our time frame, um, an outline that the other body can can take yep. and work with. We're just assuming they'll accept all the fine work we've done on grading. <laughs> I'm sure year. they will. Yeah, uh, you know, and whatever we can do to they help. Will. This is this is arguably one of the most important policy issues in education yeah. right now. So we're we have it on our radar as well. And Brad, we do you want to chime in at all? I don't I see him smiling. Correct my uh, errors. I, I have, no, no, I, I don't have anything really to add. I thought you covered things quite well. I mean, I would prefer you to do the policy pieces. Um, I have some technical questions, but I'll talk to Jim about those first, then we'll come back with those. So it just okay. uh, not, nothing that you guys need to be concerned with at the moment. <laughs> okay. Maybe never. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. We got <laughs> it under control. Oh, God. I like that thought. All right. Um, so am I hearing kind of a consensus? I think I've heard it from you in the tax department that we really should leave the uh, December 1st letter as it is. It's working. It's a technical thing. And then we do need extra staffing in Ed to carry this all out. Um, and we could use more an advisory committee, a committee with some expertise 
that could perhaps work on things to bring recommendations to the legislature. Yeah, and I think, you know, in that one, you know, it's, again, I, I look at it as, I don't think the, and I never, when talking with Representative Kornheiser in this, I never envisioned that the council would be taking over the December 1 letter. I don't, I don't see what value a deliberative group would bring to that. That's really a, a mechanical sort of analysis. Yeah. But I think the point what attracted me with the council is this idea of more eyes on the Ed Fund. In particular, you know, these weights haven't been evaluated since they basically were plucked from the sky and implemented in 97. So, um, you know, to really, to make sure the system is working, and I think this is where the interest of having the auditor involved as well, to monitor the weights, to make sure they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing on a more regular basis and to have, it, have that visibility uh, spread out over different branches would be useful as opposed to just these surprise kind of moments popping up and, or a lawsuit and so forth. Yeah, we, we're not familiar with those things. Um, let's see, so we really need just an advisory committee to, to look at the Ed Fund, to look at the forecast, look at perhaps more the way the money is going out. We look at how it's coming in, but not how it's going out. We need to be able to evaluate, and that's where it's going to be really challenging, is how do we set up in the time frame we've got now, or how do we set up a way in the near future to get curriculum or get criteria that, and you know, I've had discussions with some of my schools, and given the mental health issues and the, you know, that we're anticipating being able to keep a child sitting in his seat for more than 10 minutes or not throwing things at the teacher might be progress. Um, but it's yeah. not going to show up on a test and we might want to, you know, put the evaluation out like five yeah, years. we we have yeah. this is a key part of what my testimony has been throughout this. You know, is to really uh, focus on the quality piece because the inputs can be adjusted, but we need you know part of the challenge here uh, or a point of vulnerability is we haven't had a robust quality assurance process, and no. you know that all comes back to regulation. So our first step in doing this, we actually, we met today, the State Board of Education, we we've were charged by the legislature to do some analysis of our relative roles and responsibilities. The State Board signed off on that today. So that report will be coming to the policy committees in the General Assembly. Um, we have some foundational work to do first to, to decide who's going to be in charge of the rules, uh, because that's part of the problem now is that the Agency of Education which is held responsible, the quality assurance piece doesn't have the responsibility for the rules, the state board does. So we've been working on how to, how to make that more explicit. Wow. Once we figured that piece out, and this can happen very quickly, don't get me wrong, we have, we have to open the rules on education quality uh, to ensure that the quality standards are, are described in regulation appropriately, but more importantly, or equally important, is the quality assurance process needs to be described as well. So we have some work to do in that area that's we've been heating up in conjunction with this okay. other work. So don't get me wrong, it's, we're ready to bring that online. But the first piece of that is the roles and responsibilities of the state board. Okay. So maybe in the end, we'll just kick this can down the road and charge you with coming back with a proposal. <laughs> I think that's been tried. I mean, that was last year. Like, why doesn't the agency come back with weights, you know? Uh, but, you know, well, the no, point of- Not weights, but when we put the weights in, yeah. right. what's a fair way, given that some of these schools have been underfunded for years, Yeah, I'm still concerned about my inner city school that looks like they're not, but right. I haven't figured special ed in there. Yeah. And well, that might. Yeah. We got SPED. We've got school facilities issues. All these things are sort of, from my perspective, like tertiary issues. We need to get the yeah. foundation right on defining quality. You know, you're working on a piece here that's foundational as well, which is the funding piece. But we have some things to do in regulatory uh, space that, you know, we're bringing online for you to consider at the same time. So this, you know, maybe we should just lay out a big project of how it all looks like, you know, but these these are elemental issues that are going to help us get through the pandemic as well. So if we don't have these things organized well, we're, our, you know, basically it's pointing to making stronger school districts from an organizational perspective. If we have weak school districts from an organizational perspective, they're not going to begin to be able to address some of these complex needs. And, right. 
you know, that's the challenge right. before us. No, they're all dealing with the pandemic too at home and yep, uh, I mean, school boards are right in the middle of it, not yep. to mention all the present political climate, um, which very is challenging. very challenging. Um, okay. So stay in touch. I, it might be, since this is not the education committee, but they have kindly given this to us. Uh, and I think any report you're doing will come back to them. But some kind of a, I'm thinking, well, it's not actually a flow chart, but just a list of what's in play here. I mean, we're sure. focused on weights and you're the first time it's dawned in me. Oh, yeah, there's another big source of funding that's in play and changing. And uh, and then you need evaluation pieces for all of that. And then we have the tools, you know, which are like the accounting yeah. standards, the SSCDMS project, you know, the tools by which we would manage and make sense of these things and improve the data quality. You know, all these things are being managed right now and so it's it's not an unsimple environment no it is not but we have plans to manage okay it, so. good um all right so committee any questions or is everybody kind of as overwhelmed as i'm feeling at this point and i thought i couldn't get any worse than brad's <laughs> spreadsheets we see which that i'm actually often. starting to understand <laughs> We see that often, not only when Brad's spreadsheets are introduced, but anytime education topics are introduced. Yeah, well, I'm we still that, trying uh, to explain to the Barry School Board what's going on. But. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. I, uh, this has been helpful. Um, good. Well, we're here to help. Good. All right. Committee. I, that's it for the agenda.